light for our path, that guide, guides us and blesses us. Lord, apart from you, we would be wandering in the wilderness, just like the Israelites. And we have you to guide us, to direct us. Lord, we thank you for each other here this morning. We thank you for calling us together. We thank you for making us your people and for being our God. Lord, help us to focus on your word this morning, to fellowship together, to even uh, dine on your word, and to dine with you. Thank you for your word. Be with the message. Be with us, Lord God, and help us to learn from you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Someone can crank the lights on, otherwise you're not going to be able to see me. All right, so I appreciate that. Thanks. Come on, guys. Lighten up a little bit. All right, okay. <laughs> Folks in Southeast Indiana are way too tense. All right. Turn to uh, Galatians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Uh, and the title of the message is Freedom in the Gospel. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. For instance, in our world today, especially in our country, we see the word and we hear the word freedom. And it's tossed around quite a bit in our vocabulary. Uh, this is most prevalent when we think about political issues and we're debating, you know, what does it mean to truly have freedom? Uh, we ask Congress, we ask the judicial system, we ask the executive branches to define what these things mean. And we talk about the Constitution. And whenever we're talking about the word freedom, we are dealing with things like individual rights. But here's an important question for all of us to consider. Do you and I really have the freedom to do whatever we want? That's the first question. So when we say that I have freedom as an American, what do I really mean by that? Even when I say that I have freedom in Christ, does it mean that I can do whatever I want? Or does it mean that I can use that freedom within a set of guidelines that have already been established? It's an important question for all of us to consider and to think about. Why do I bring this up? Because when we look at the book of Galatians, the concept of freedom in Christ is screaming out at us. What exactly do the words freedom in Christ really mean? What have I been freed from, and how can I operate in this freedom that God has granted to me? So we're going to answer those questions. What does it mean to truly experience the freedom we have in Christ, and then to live out the freedom that we have in Christ? Remember again the context of the book of Galatians. The church is dealing with a group of people called uh, Judaizers. Paul has confronted them with his letter. Uh, these are people who are focused on the Mosaic law and traditions. And they're saying that you need to obey these things in order to have eternal life. And you know Paul has a completely different message than what they have been preaching. And his has been that you need to have faith in Christ alone. And that is the freedom that Paul is going to express for us here this morning. Let me give you a little bit of context as to what is happening. For instance, in chapter 1, Paul's gospel was being questioned because he said that it came from God. The Judaizers were self-appointed. They were those that said, we get our laws from Mosaic law, we get it from the traditions. But Paul is saying that I have received this message about the gospel of Jesus Christ directly from Jesus himself. You remember Paul's dramatic conversion on the way to Damascus. He's there because he's wanting to persecute Christians, and Jesus confronts him, and his life is forever changed. After he gets saved, he goes into three years where it's just between him and Jesus. He goes to Damascus, he goes to Tarsus, then he goes to Jerusalem. So these are all things that Paul did by himself prior to going out and meeting any of the apostles. So in chapter 1, his apostleship is questioned because he says the gospel he has received comes directly from God. But in chapter 2, there's something different that happens. Paul is going to go up to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles. Is he going to meet with the apostles because he needs their permission to go out and proclaim the gospel? No. He goes to the apostles in Jerusalem because they are going to confirm and validate that the gospel that Paul is preaching is the exact same gospel that they are preaching. Paul can finally make the claim and verify that the same Jesus who spoke to him on the road to Damascus is the same Jesus that the apostles spent three years with, and it is the same gospel that they are going to come to the conclusion of. And there is going to be no debate, because Paul is on the team of the disciples, and both of them are in opposition to the Judaizers who are teaching a works-based system. So let's take a look at this context in Galatians chapter 2, 
Let's talk about freedom and what that means and the implication that has for us today. Look at how Paul begins chapter 2. His first words are, then after 14 years. If you add up the three years after Paul's conversion, that would mean that Paul preached the gospel without human instruction for 17 years. Here's what's interesting about this, is that Paul had been busy in God's work. It's not as if Paul got saved and God revealed himself to him, and then Paul says, you know what, I'm going to go spend time alone, and I'm going to be alone until God calls me home. After the time that he spent with Jesus Christ, Paul was ready to go out, he was ready to step out and proclaim the good news to the Gentiles, because this is what God had called him to do. Before I go any further, let me ask you this question. How about you? Let me give you some few application points and we parallel them to Paul. And this is how you know if you are truly spending time with God. Because think about this. If you are spending time with God and you are in the Word of God, and the Word of God goes into your heart, it's not just going to remain there. It's going to transform you and renew you. And you're going to look more like Jesus. So there are things that you're going to desire to do because God's desire has been placed inside of you. So when you are spending time with God, here are some good indicators that you truly are in fellowship with God and His Word and God's people. Here it is. Number one is that you have a desire to serve and to reach out to people. Because you know the message of Scripture is that every single one of us is going to die one day and we're going to have to give an account of our lives to God one day. So if I know that I have to stand before God and give an account of my life, if I realize there are people around me that don't know Christ, and I read that, that there's an eternal punishment, if I am in the Word of God, I'm not just going to sit back and say, well, I just have too many things going on. God's Word is going to cause me to serve and to reach out to people because eternity is at stake. So if you truly understand God's passion, if you are really in God's Word, you're going to serve people, you're going to reach out to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's something else. You're going to fellowship with like-minded people. See, when you are spending time in the Word of God, you need encouragement from other people to say, hey, you know what, I know you're battling some of the same things, let me help you along, let me pray for you. Hey, if you need to call me and talk to me, I'm available anytime. See, what I've realized is that we have become so busy in our lives, we have become so busy in things that are temporal, that we don't have any time for God, and then we sit back and say, is God really using me? Is God really working in my life? I guarantee you, if you were to take an inventory of this past week, there are things that you could have absolutely done without, and they would have been beneficial to you. Think about how much time you know you spent on Facebook or watching television shows that had absolutely no eternal value for your soul. Am I against Facebook? Sometimes. Okay? Am I against television shows? Not really. I understand that there's entertainment, there's things that we do and we go on vacations. I get all of those things. But here's what I'm saying. When Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you, He did not say it can come in second, third, and fourth place. When he talks about seeking his kingdom, he's talking about being fully invested in seeking out what God has for your life. So if you see church and Christian service and sharing the gospel as a checklist that you are going through week by week, then what you are basically doing is you are practicing the same faith that the lost world is practicing. Well, what do I mean by that? Because those are some pretty strong statements. Here's what I mean. If you simply see church and sharing the gospel and reading your Bible as a work system so that God won't pour out His wrath on you and be upset with you, do you realize this is the same worldly system that is there in Islam and Hinduism, Buddhism, and religions of the world? So you and I don't realize this, but when we are not fellowshipping with God and spending time with His Word, and when we do, we're like, oh man... I'm so glad I did that. Do you realize that you actually have a very Eastern pagan worldview? See, we understand that we are under God's grace. That we are spared from eternal judgment. So when I do spiritual things, I'm not doing them so God will be happy with me. God is already pleased with me because I have His Son, Jesus Christ. 
So you need to discipline yourself and say, am I truly in the Word of God? Am I praying? Am I spending time sharing the Gospel? Am I invested in God's people? Do I see church in my life as a priority? Or does it simply become a social activity? You have to ask yourself these tough questions. Paul spent time with God alone, but not only did he spend time with God alone, it resonated in his life. People were able to see it because he could not stop sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if that meant going to prison. Look at this commentary by William Barclay about this. Here's what he says. After 14 years' work, he went up to Jerusalem, taking with him Titus, a young friend and henchman who was a Greek. That visit was by no means easy. Even as he wrote, there was agitation in Paul's mind. There is a disorder in the Greek which is not possible fully to reproduce in English translation. Paul's problem was that he could not say too little, or he might seem to be abandoning his principles. And he could not say too much, or it might seem that he was at open variance with the leaders of the church. This result was, the result was that his sentences are broken and disjointed, reflecting his anxiety. These verses that Paul is writing, when you look at the original language, that's how he's writing. That there is hesitation within his writing, there is fear, trying to please, you know, the leaders here, and speak against a group of people here. So when you're reading these words, don't simply read them and say, well, Paul was pretty comfortable as he's writing this. No, there is a battle going on in his soul regarding the things that he's writing, even when it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Look at what happens. It says, then after 14 years, the second part of verse 2 says, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. Now something interesting about this is that Paul and Barnabas had just completed their first missionary journey and they returned to Antioch to report that Gentiles were trusting in the grace of Christ. This is pretty radical. Here is Paul, someone who was a Pharisee, someone who was a Jew. He teams up with Barnabas. And they are going out and proclaiming the gospel. This is exactly what God had called them to do. Look at Acts chapter 13. It says, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. There was amazing work that was being done among the Gentiles. Paul teaming up with Barnabas, later on Titus comes with him to Jerusalem that we're going to talk about. But this is incredible. Paul gets radically saved, he spends time with God, God tells him that he's going to commission him to the Gentiles, and man, he gets to see the outworking of what God is planning for. One of the greatest things that you will experience in your life, and one of the greatest questions that you can have answered is, what is my purpose here on earth? If you think about it, every single believer has some type of purpose here on earth. If you are a Christian today and you say, well, my purpose is to work 9 to 5, show up to church on Sunday, and then go home and live however I want. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What truly is your purpose? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What has God placed me here on this earth for? I can guarantee you it's not simply to do your job, but it is to reach out to people, to love people, to serve. Sometimes it's to do the simple things that God has called us to do and to be. Paul had this mission figured out in his life. But why does he need to go up to Jerusalem? According to Acts chapter 15, here's what had happened. Professing Jewish Christians had gone from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the customs of Moses as a means of salvation. Here we go again. Paul has spent so much time telling them what the true gospel is, that if someone preaches a gospel other than the one that he has proclaimed, they're to be accursed. But there were leaders from these churches that had gone and started influencing and started teaching a different gospel. It was a gospel that was different than the one that Paul and the, uh, and the apostles had proclaimed. So Paul takes Barnabas and Titus and he goes up to Jerusalem and he has a conversation with the apostles and they end up absolutely crushing this group of Judaizers. Look at Acts chapter 15 verses 1 and 2. It says that certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren 
unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Here's what's happening. These group of Judaizers thought to themselves, boy, these apostles are going to oppose Paul. Because here is this man, Paul, he's all about the Gentiles, about reaching out to the Gentiles. We as Jews know that these people are unclean, that they are not part of the covenant of God. And here they are thinking that Paul is going to be opposed by the apostles, and actually it's something different that ends up happening. The apostles end up siding with the apostle Paul. Look at a couple other things here. First of all, they go to Jerusalem. It's the first great council as recorded in Acts chapter 15. He takes with him Barnabas. Barnabas was known as the son of encouragement. But then the question is, why would you take someone like Titus to Jerusalem? Here's why you take him. Number one is that Titus was a young preacher, Gentile, and a co-worker of, uh, co of Paul. Look at Titus chapter 1, verses uh, 1, 4, and 5. It says, To Titus, a true son, in our common faith. You've got to love what Paul has done, and I can't help but think that Paul wants to agitate them a little bit. Because what better way to take off some Pharisees and Judaizers than to take a Gentile with you who has experienced the grace of God? See, it's one thing, you think about the tensions that took place in New Testament times and even Old Testament between Jew and Gentile. They could not stand each other, but then you have something like the cross that changes everything. Now there's no Jew and Gentile, there's just one, and those who are in Christ. And Paul says, you know what, in order to make sure that I'm making this point, I'm going to take Titus with me to Jerusalem to show these Judaizers what it truly means to understand God's grace. Another point is this, is that Titus was a godly man because of the grace of Christ apart from any works. I want you to pause and think about this for a second. Have you ever asked yourself tough questions regarding God's grace? Why am I saying this? Paul is introducing to us this concept of what true salvation means. There's a debate back and forth. Do I trust in the law or do I trust in Christ? He wants to settle this argument. He takes Barnabas. He takes Titus with them up to Jerusalem. Judaizers think the apostles are going to side with them. No, they end up siding with the apostle Paul. But here's why Paul ends up taking Titus with him. Because not only is he a Gentile, but he has been changed by the grace of God apart from any ceremonial or external works. So I want you to consider and ask yourself this question. How about yourself? Has God's grace really changed you? Has God's grace really changed you? Here's why I ask that. Because when God saves you, it's not a change from the outside in. It's a change from the inside out. Jesus talks to us about the heart of the issue. He says, if you want to understand what sin is, if you want to understand murders and theft and lying and all of these different sins, they're not caused because of external circumstances. They're caused because your heart is sinful towards God. See, what we have in our culture today is people say, the way that I am because of what has happened to me. You know, this person said this to me. You know, this happened to me when I was young. And yes, all of those are legitimate issues. But if you really want to experience change in your life, the Bible is telling us that our hearts have to be changed. And the only way that change can take place is if God's grace changes us from the inside out. So ask yourself the question, has God's grace really changed you? That you so experienced the grace of God and that He saved you from eternal damnation. He gave you eternal life. Now everything in your life should be a gratitude for what God has done. Has grace really changed you? Here's my follow-up question, and this is a tough one. Have you shown God's grace to others the same way that God has shown His grace to you? Ouch. That's a tough one, isn't it? 
You know, there are small things that tick us off, and there are big things that tick us off. You know, there are small things that tick us off, and I've mentioned this to you before. Uh, you know, something as simple as someone driving in the slow lane, right? They, they gets on your skin, and trust me, there's been a couple times where I've just been like, man, I'm losing it. What is wrong with this person? And then I pass them, and I see some person on their cell phone. I'm like, really, okay? And I, and I get upset, right? And when I, when I go in front of them and I turn, I don't even put the turn signal on. <laughs> right? Because I'm in my flesh. I'm admitting this to you. That's why I don't have a fish sticker on the back of my car. <laughs> right? Because if I'm speeding, they can't say, well, there's that Christian. If I cut them off, they can't say, there's that Jesus follower. Right? I get upset in my flesh because I've got places to go. Those are small things that tick me off. You know, we laugh about it. It's true. But then there are large things that tick us off as well. We, we think about people. We think about circumstances. And we think about how angry we get towards other people. And we have all done this to others. But think about this. When God showed His grace towards us, when we were so sinful towards Him, not only before salvation, but even when we mess up in salvation, and yet He keeps pouring out His grace on us, how should that translate into the relationships in your life. Folks, I'm not saying that grace is easy to show or to give, but can we at least make an attempt and take a step into it towards the people in our lives? To be reconcilers, to be ambassadors, as 2 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 5 tells us. Here's my third follow-up question. Do you live out God's grace? Do you live out God's grace? Has grace changed you? If you're a believer, your answer should be yes. Have you shown God's grace to others? Hopefully you do, even if it's taking baby steps. Or number three, do you live out His grace? Is it evident to the people in your life that you are someone who is changed by the grace of God? Or do you still show signs of the old self? Here's my challenge to you. If God saves you, God is going to change you. And maybe the reason you're not changing and conforming to the image of Jesus Christ is it because you're not spending enough time in the Word of God. Because if you are spending enough time in the Word of God, God's Word will transform you. It is a promise we have from Scripture. God doesn't say, well, maybe my Word might change you. No, He says His Word will change you because it pierces the deepest parts of our soul. And it exposes who we are in the light of who He is has grace changed your life? Paul wanted to show these folks what the new covenant looked like. Titus was someone who was changed. He experienced the grace of God. He helped the apostle Paul. And he wanted to show the leaders of Jerusalem, look, this man has not gone through the Jewish ceremonies, but God has transformed his heart. And look at how he looks and behaves and the things that he's doing. It has only happened because of something radical on the inside. Can I tell you that it is always easy to please people and you can put on a show and fool them, right? It is. It's so easy to do. You know, what's amazing is one of the uh, advantages that I have is I get to travel overseas and you know the sad part is, and many times when you travel to different countries and they realize that you're an American, they flock to you. They're like, oh man, it's so good to hear you and we were so blessed by your message. Can you pray for us? And you know, here you are thinking, you know, I'm battling things in my mind. You have no idea what I'm going through. But at the same time, that's, you can put on a show for people. But ultimately, at the end of the day, God knows our hearts. We can fool people, but we can't fool God. We, God can look at our intentions, why we do things the way that we do. We can always fool people, but God knows our hearts. It is this that Paul wanted to proclaim, that these Pharisees, these Judaizers, we're all about external religion, but God was more concerned about the heart. And he used Titus as an example when he went to Jerusalem. Look at verse 2. Paul says this, And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Let me parse a couple words here. Number one, the word revelation. God directly tells Paul to go to Jerusalem to proclaim the gospel he was declaring. No human entity told him this. It was God who directly relayed this to him. And then the second word that he uses is the word communicated. It literally means to lay something before someone for consideration. 
So Paul goes up and he puts this out before them, and here is the message that Paul wanted to commit and communicate, the message of faith in Christ alone for salvation. Here's why these next few verses are ones that I love, because they absolutely crush the idea of a works-based system for salvation. If you have people in your life who like to argue about doing good works in order to have salvation, and they don't believe in faith in Christ alone, these are great verses to highlight for them. Here we go. Number one is Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Well, we're getting on a roll here. This is good. By the deeds of the law, you can't keep the law perfectly. There's only one who did, and that is Jesus Christ. The law showed the righteousness and the holiness of God and who He is and what He expects of His people. Here's another one, Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, here we go, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. You can't do good works. All right, here's another one, Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is what the Bible is teaching us, but then we have religious people who are telling us, you need to do good work so that God can be happy with you. Here's the bottom line. If God is telling me something and people are telling me something, I'm going to believe in God. You know, too many times when it comes to issues of salvation, we kind of like to play the middle ground a little bit with people. Why? Because we don't want to offend people. We're like, well, yeah, you believe that. You know, and that's okay, but this would, no, it's not okay. Because to simply say that's okay is to compromise on something that Scripture is very bold about, that it is only through faith in Christ alone that we have true salvation. It is the message all of us need to be proclaiming. This is what Paul laid out for them. But look at another thing here. It says, he goes to Jerusalem, but privately to those who were of reputation. Possibly a reference to Peter, James the brother of the Lord, and John of Zebedee. The Judaizers basically, again, were assuming that the 12 apostles would side with them against Paul. I love how Paul does this. Paul, out of respect for the apostles, he consults with them privately about the matter. Why does he do this? Here's what he says, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Here's what David Guzik says about this note. He says, this probably did not come from the fear that he himself would fall away. Probably it was the fear that an unnecessary conflict with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem leaders might damage his reputation and ministry in some way. Also, the danger was that false teachers, if encouraged in some way by the leaders in Jerusalem, might undo Paul's work in planting churches and raising disciples for Jesus, and therefore would make Paul's work in vain. He goes to them privately, he has a conversation with them, he's very adamant about the grace of God, they obviously end up agreeing with him. But I look at verse 3, it says that yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be <coughs> circumcised. Now this is an important point because Titus was accepted as a believer without being circumcised. Now, now here's, the, here's the funny part about this, okay? I can just imagine Titus being a Greek, going with the Apostle Paul, and Paul is so adamant about this point in that he says, you don't need to be circumcised in order to have salvation, and I can just see Titus as a grown man saying, praise the Lord. <laughs> He's just going, hallelujah, I don't need surgery, right? He's like, I'm all about this faith in Christ saving me, right? Imagine that for a second. Titus goes with Paul, and he's hearing this, and he's like, yes, I absolutely agree with this statement. As humorous as it is, it shows you how minuscule sometimes these issues had become during the New Testament times. Here's another note. It says this, the circumcision of Titus was a potential issue because circumcision was a sign of initiation into the Jewish faith and the Mosaic Covenant. 
If a Gentile man wanted to become a Jew, he would have to be circumcised as an adult. Jewish men were circumcised as babies. Since all Jewish men were circumcised and most all Gentile men were not, it was an easy way to refer to those who were part of the covenant and those who were outside of the covenant of Moses. Everything had to do with external rituals. And Paul is coming here and saying, look at Titus. He is a man who has been changed by the grace of God. It is a work that has taken place in his heart. It was an issue of contention in the book of Acts. Look at Acts chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. It says, Now then, why do you try, try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Keep it simple. Keep the message of salvation simple. Do you realize today we live in a world that where they complicate the message of the gospel and what it means to come to Christ? Have you grown up in a situation, maybe in your past when you were going to church, and people said, well, you got to come to church, dress really nice, you got to have a certain type of haircut, you can't have facial hair, or you can't have facial hair, you can do this, and you need to do this, and then you come to God and you'll be okay. We, we've all been part of that, right? Where we've seen that happen in our past history. Rules and regulations that the Bible never ever imposed on us, but that men and women who have legalism in their hearts are imposing on people. And we make things so difficult in our spiritual walk. Here's my advice to you when you're considering your walk with God. Keep it simple and keep the main thing the main thing. Don't, don't complicate things. Well, what do we need to do? We need to read the Word of God. We need to be praying. We need to be fellowshipping with God and His people. And you'll be amazed how God grows you so through some of the most simple things that you can do in your spiritual walk. The reason many times that we are not growing in our walk with God is because we have this business plan for our spiritual life that we need to execute. And only when I do that will I see growth. And God is saying, no, keep it simple. Just be in my Word and you'll be amazed what I can teach you and how I can grow you. Folks, if we are doing the simple things, we're going to complicate our spiritual life with other things that can come in. The issue of circumcision was a big deal. But in the New Covenant, you did not have to do that. Why? Because it was God who was changing your heart from the inside out, not based on external rituals. It was the work that was done in the heart. It is interesting, however, to note some years later that Paul would ask Timothy to be circumcised not because of obligation, but because of contextualization and assimilation. Let me share with you what I mean by this. And maybe I can finish off on this point as God leads us in communion. Here, here's what's interesting. Timothy was half Jewish. For instance, look at Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. It says, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Why? Now, first of all, I get to see Timothy being really mad at Titus, right? Man, how did you not have to do that? How do I have to do this, okay? This is just wrong, but why did he have to do it? Because this allowed Timothy to have entrance and impact in synagogues. See, Titus could not have ministry in the synagogues. Why? Because he was trying to reach out to the Jews. Timothy was circumcised. So Timothy, even as being a half-Jew, could have ministry in the synagogues. So I want, to, I want you to step back and think about this and what is going on in the book of Galatians. And we'll close out this point and Don will come and lead us in communion. What do I mean by those two words? contextualization and assimilation. Here's what I mean by that, and I'll illustrate this even further. It means becoming the people that you're reaching out to, so becoming the people without compromising your faith so that you become a bridge, not a barrier, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me share that with you one more time. 
by becoming the people without compromising your faith so that you become a bridge, not a barrier to the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Think about what Paul is doing when he asks even Timothy to do this. What do I mean by contextualization and assimilation? Here's what I mean by that. When I travel to different countries, and I've seen this especially in countries like Nepal or India, here's what has happened historically. Is that sometimes missionaries have come from America or Europe, and they go to the land of India that has a different language, that has a different culture, that has different customs. And what these missionaries did was they came to these lands, and they basically said, okay, we're going to be missionaries to these people, but they always saw the people as being those people. What they did was they built houses, nice big houses, with walls around them, fancy houses, and what they did was they ended up employing servants from the country to work in their houses. So now you have American missionaries or European missionaries going to distant lands and wanting to say, well, we're reaching out to these people, but they weren't becoming the people. So they were still maintaining their American or Western identity, and it was so strong, and they weren't having success reaching out to the people that were in these lands. Because the people in these lands looked at them and said, wait a minute, you're coming here to share the gospel with us, but you don't want to eat our food, you don't want to wear our clothes, you don't want to become the people that are here in this country, how can you possibly reach out? Then you have some other missionaries, for instance, there's a very popular missionary that went to South India, and you may have heard her name, Amy Carmichael. She goes to South India, and there's many missionaries that do this even today, uh, girls that I've seen that are Americans and from Europe that go to slums, and what they do is they have blonde hair, but they will dye their hair black because the women in these slums have black hair. They will wear the clothing of these ladies. Why? So that they can identify with them. Notice they are not compromising their faith. They are becoming, as Paul says, all things to all people so that I might win some. See, see, understand this. When you are communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that are different than you, don't be scared to become them without becoming them. You see what I'm saying? If you truly have a heart for people, and let's say you want to reach somebody in downtown Cincinnati, and you're like, man, God is really burdening my heart. You know what you need to do? You need to go to a church in downtown Cincinnati, take part in their fellowship, maybe even move to downtown Cincinnati, so that you can become the people, you can serve in that context, you have assimilated with them, and still maintain your faith so that you can reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is incredible how you can reach people when you are willing to be a bridge rather than a barrier to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what we do in our minds? Honestly, I've found this out over and over again. We say this, if that person is not in my political party, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Oh man, you know, they're not wearing a certain hat, or they don't follow this political person. You know, that's what we do. We end up distancing ourselves from people based on things that have no eternal value. Folks, can I tell you, all around the world today, political issues are there, but you know what they're concerned about? They're concerned about reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God, I'm going to tell you right now, your political party is not going to save your soul. It's not going to do a thing for you. Let me tell you this. It does not matter how conservative the Supreme Court is if God does not change a person's heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. It really doesn't matter. Amen. The true answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can hold your conservative views. You can hold your positions when it comes to politics. But don't you dare abandon the call when Jesus says, go out and preach the gospel to all nations. Imagine what communities would look like. Imagine what your life would look like if you were willing to be a bridge to someone that held opposing worldview to what you hold. Imagine how radical it would be to reach out to people who are not like you and to say, the reason that I'm doing this is not because it's comfortable, not because I like it, so that I can make Christ known to them. Think about people in your life today as I close up. Think about the people in your life that you say it is absolutely difficult to build a bridge to them. These are the people that God is calling you. 
to reach out to. Paul did it to Timothy. He said, you want to have an influence with the Jewish community? You really want to reach out to those who don't know Jesus, who are stuck to the Mosaic Law? Here's what you need to do. You need to have this physical act done, not because it saves you, but so that you can have entrance and you can have acceptance from those who are lost, so that you can have greater communication in presenting the gospel to them. That's what it truly means to have freedom in the gospel. We'll complete the next part of it next week. But ask yourself this question. Are you really free in your freedom in Christ? Or have you put unwanted bondage on yourself by having a checklist thinking that that's what God is going to be pleased with? Examine your heart. If you are free in Christ, you truly are free in Christ. There is no judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Because Christ has set me free. Let's bow for a word of prayer as Don comes up and leads us in our time of communion. Father, I pray that you would prepare our hearts. Lord, help us to understand who we are in the light of your grace. We are not deserving of it. There is nothing that we could do. But Father, it is only because of what you have done for us, your finished work on the cross. And Father, I pray that as a result of that, we would be willing to reach out to people who are not like us, who don't think like us, so that Jesus can be proclaimed. Father, so many things distract us. So many excuses we make, Father. But Lord, if we are not concerned about your kingdom, foremost, we are being disobedient to what you have called us to do and to be. So Father, I pray that even in this time of communion, that we would reflect on your goodness, and that we would understand what you did for us. And Father, may you receive all the praise, honor, and glory. For I ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.